Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's Wednesday, 23rd of April. It's 2 o'clock. You're all very welcome to Planning Committee. Uh, please can ensure uh, mobile phones are off. Obviously, I welcome the public being here, but if you wouldn't mind being quiet while we hear the planning applications, um, I would also like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. We'll move straight on to procedural business. 184A, are there any substitutes? No, brilliant. Um, are there on any declarations of interest or lobbying under item B? No, under item C, I will not be excluding the press or public for any item today. And under any item, under, under item D, excuse me, um, can members please ensure mobile phones are switched off? If you're using a tablet to access your papers today, please ensure it's switched to aeroplane mode. Can I agree the minutes of the last meeting as a correct record? Mr. Gowans. Thank you, Chairman. Um, relating to page 9 of our bundle and paragraph 12, which begins in response to Mr. Gowans, may I propose that the following is also minuted? Mr. Gowans asked why the outline of the proposed student accommodation had been omitted from the north elevation drawings which were submitted. The officer's reply was that it was due to a drafting error. Yeah, I remember that. Thank you, Mr. Gowans. Thank you. Ross, can you make sure those minutes are appended accordingly? Um, there are no public questions. Um, are there at this stage um, any councillors who wish to have a site visit on any of the items in front of us? Nope. We'll move straight on to the planning applications in front of us. There's been a slight reconfiguration. There have been two deferrals. So they are items B and F. That's 112 Carden Avenue and the land to the rear of 4 to 34 Kimberley Road, Brighton. If there's anyone in the audience for items B, that's 112 Carton Avenue, or item F, that's the land to the rear of 4 to 34 Kimberley Road, Brighton, if there are any uh, members of the public here for those items, we will not be considering them at this committee. They have both been deferred. Because of uh, speakers on particular items today, the order has been reconfigured also. We will move through the agenda as following. Item A, item C, item E, item G, item D, and finally item H. That's item A, item C, item E, item G, item D, and finally item H. We will move to the first application today, which is BH 2013-03624 for full planning at the Westbourne Public House, 90 Portland Road in Hove. The recommendation is to grant. The report begins on page 17, and I'll pass over to Nicola for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The application relates to a public house which is located on the western corner of Portland Road with Westbourne Street. The building is two storeys and forms the end of a terrace comprising 90 to 102 Portland Road. So this is the application site here, which is edged in red. This is a block plan. This is the pub garden as existing. This is the existing windows in the rear elevation. This is the existing access steps into the garden. And this is a view from Westbourne Street. This application was also subject to a member site visit yesterday. Planning permission is sought for the raising of the rear garden level through the construction of a raised decking and incorporating the erection of a bamboo screen on the west side of the garden area. This is a view towards the um, beer garden from Westbourne Grove. So this is the existing ground floor and this is the pub garden here with the stepped access from, from the pub down into the garden. And this is as proposed. So effectively it levels the garden area and allows access from internally, externally, without having to go down um, any steps. This is the existing east elevation, and this is as proposed. The scheme also proposes some new window, uh, window replacements. This is the existing south elevation, and as proposed, so you see here the increased height 
of the floor with the doors leading from, from the public house. This is a proposed section which shows the pub garden and another section which shows the bamboo screening. Letters of representation have been received from neighbouring occupiers objecting to the application and the reasons are outlined on page 20 of your report. Two additional letters of support have also been received from the occupiers of 62 Westbourne Street and 61 Lawrence Road. The main issues of consideration relate to the impact of the development and the character and appearance of the building in the wider area and the effect on the residential amenity of neighbouring properties. The application seeks consent for the raising of the level of the rear garden area by approximately 1.1 metres. This element of the proposal itself would have a limited impact on the character and appearance of the Supreme building or on the wider area. Bamboo screens with a fixed aluminium planter with a combined height of approximately 1.7 metres would be installed on the western side of the raised garden area in order to safeguard the amenities of properties and gardens to the west of the garden area. It is not considered that the post screening would be of detriment to the visual amenities to the parent property. An existing gated opening in the southern part of the eastern boundary of the garden area will be removed and the opening infilled to match the rest of the retained wall. Currently, the hours of the existing beer garden area are not restricted and can be used when the pub is opened, which is from 10am to half past midnight. The last noise complaint was received by the council in 2008. The alterations to the rear garden would provide for a raised platform and the elevator position could potentially allow increased noise from the application site. However, it's not considered to result in additional noise and disturbance compared to the existing situation. The provision of a screen towards the western side of the garden of the garden would mitigate overlooking and loss of privacy. To conclude, the alterations are not considered to harm the building or have a detrimental impact on neighbouring immunity and the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two public speakers on this item. The first speaker is Anne Catherine Jack. If you're here, I'd like to come forward. Mm. Hopefully it will have been explained to you three minutes to speak. I'll tap the microphone. When you have 20 seconds left. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank you all to the committee for taking the time to visit the site yesterday. Uh, I understand from my neighbours that you had a chance to sort of see. Um, I will be speaking uh, today on behalf of the neighbours of Westbourne Gardens and some Westbourne Streets. Um, our homes or my home, is located uh, right at the back of the, the proposal. Um, we uh, are a good neighbourhood and uh, we are customers of the Westbourne pub, so we're not here to sort of impede on, on their business. Uh, we want to be fair to, uh, to the, the business as well. Our, uh, pardon. Our objections are based on uh, two concerns. The concerns are based on the noise that the door opening, the double door opening that we can see up there, would create and a raised floor level, which is quite considerable um, to raise uh, the floor height. Uh, that would um, create more noise because there is, I believe, a kitchen, an open kitchen at the back of these and obviously noise from customers that would go into the garden uh, at all times of opening. We are also uh, concerned to an extent uh, that, because there's a lot of noise, uh, there would be maybe poor language used in the garden, uh, which would affect, uh, could affect uh, children in the residential um, uh, streets. We, we felt that uh, on the second proposal, the bamboo screening did not really um, consider to be a long-term solution to the noise problem, and it really didn't address uh, what, we, what we asked. Uh, speaking to, uh, to neighbors in the street, um, the noise does travel through down through uh, the gardens, and uh, when there are noise in the garden, we do hear it quite a lot. So I can imagine that on a nice summer day, where there's a lot of customers that are outside, it would be quite considerable and quite late, potentially at night. Okay, that's 
that's what uh, I came here to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. Um, are there any questions? Councillor Hyde. Thank you. Um, would you be prepared to say exactly what your address is? Because you say it's going to affect you. We have a map here, so obviously that would be of assistance. Further questions? Councillor Cox. Uh, could you put either the first or second photo up, please? Could you confirm that which one of those is your property? Green one. It's the cream building, isn't it? It's the cream building that's directly ahead there, isn't it? 85. And, and is, is there a garden behind? You've got a garden there, have you? Did you have a notice of this application from the planning office? Okay. Councillor Davey. <coughs> Thank you very much. So, sorry, just so I'm clear, is 85 Westbourne Gardens? That's where you are, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so the garden at the moment, I mean, it doesn't look very used, but is that actually used at the moment? And yeah. Yes, can you, can you, thank you. Um, so the picture doesn't show our garden. This is not our garden, this is the pub garden, yes. Obviously our garden is used as a patio with, with little chairs. Is that what you were asking me to do? No, say, okay, sorry. <laughs> So, I mean, is the pub garden used at the moment? Because it doesn't look very used, but I just wonder whether it is or not. I believe it is at some times, although at the moment people tend to be more at the front uh, in, in the, the area in the street where there's a lot of smokers. What we do hear is considerable noise every day of the bottles being emptied into a recycling uh, area. Okay. Councillor Jones. Thank you. Um, but has, has the noise of the customers been, been a, a problem, a serious problem for you up to now? Has, has the noise from the customers been a serious problem for you up to now? Because I can see that there hasn't been uh, a serious complaint made since, since about 2008. So I'm just wondering what it's like currently. Well, to be fair, there hasn't been a, a lot of noise from the pubs in the evening. We haven't lived uh, in the house for very long, so I can only vouch until sort of last year, July. Okay, thank you. Further questions? No? Thanks very much for coming in today. If you'd like to take your seat again, thank you. Um, the next speaker is Emma London, please. You're very welcome to Planning Committee. You'll have three minutes again, and I'll tap the mic when you have 20 seconds. You can start when you're comfortable. Um, hello, hello. My name's Emma, and I own the Westbourne and operate the Westbourne with my partner, Graham, who's with me today. When we bought the pub in January 2007, it was a rundown, poorly managed venue. It had, had had a reputation for trouble and had regular visits from the police to defuse problems. We've worked very hard to transform the pub into a desirable venue to visit, which welcomes the whole community and provides a meeting place for local people and um, to meet in a safe and welcoming environment in which to socialize and relax. We're also residents. We live on site with our two young children who are both attending West Hove Infant School shortly. Um, and we've been involved in community projects ranging from street parties, which are now an annual event, to charity events to raise money for local um, causes. Westbourne Street residents, in fact, meet on a monthly basis in the pub to dis discuss ways to develop the sense of community, but also, more importantly, just to socialise and get to know each other. Our application 
is a part of our ongoing commitment to improve the building and thereby add positively to the community and local amenities. We would like to make it more accessible to those with disabilities and enable them to enjoy the garden. The French doors would also enable better management of the garden by providing a visual link inside and out. There would be no increase in capacity. The bamboo screen would remove the increased risk of overlooking. And we have air conditioning, which allows us to prevent noise escape on busy evenings by keeping doors and windows closed in the summer. We've managed the pub for the last seven years in a responsible manner and make every effort to minimize our impact on our neighbors and the surrounding area in terms of noise or disturbance. In this time, as the planning officer has pointed out in her report, we have not had a single noise complaint relating to the garden or the outside areas. In addition to the letters of support from residents mentioned in the officer's report, several more supporting our application have been submitted since the report was prepared, and I believe we now have seven letters of support from neighbours, many with very positive comments in favour of our application. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, Councillor? Councillor Theobald. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I just wonder what sort of hours this garden area is open and what is proposed to be open. Um, and you talk about the windows being shut. If there's double doors there, would the doors be open uh, so the noise is out? And a third question was about the recycling that was being mentioned. Do you do that at funny hours, like at night or anything, the bottles? Um, firstly, I apologize. The, the garden in that photograph, we haven't had it open over the winter because the floor is very difficult to maintain, and this is an issue we've been wanting to address, but we've been waiting for the outcome of this application. Um, but we have had it in use throughout the time we've been in the pub. Um, uh, when we have it open, we always make an effort. We, although we, we're not obligated to, we always make an effort to close it between 10 and 10.30 um, because we want to be good neighbors and we don't want to encourage um, excessive noise to the rear where obviously it's more residential we have the area at the front so the garden is usually always closed by 10.30 in the evening um, as far as recycling goes we recycle our bottles and we do that in the morning um, before we open um, between 10 in the morning and midday and it's literally usually two um, bins with empty bottles in that are thrown into the recycling um, bin. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Hyde. Yes, Councillor Seabold has touched on where I was going to come, but I'm going to ask a question now, which is a sort of... Um, Hillary will come in and tell me if it's not appropriate at this point, but I know this is a separate regime to licensing, but I am on the licensing committee, and it's the is sort it of thing... The applicant? Yes. Okay. I'm getting there, Chairman, yes. Um... Right, my question is, um, as I said, Councillor Seabold has touched on this. Um, at the moment, because it isn't such a beautiful outside area, I presume this garden facility is not used as much as you wish it would be, hence your investment in it. And therefore, there is a likelihood that there would be a lot more people there and therefore more noise. You have mentioned that you close your doors between 10 and 10.30. And I would wonder how you would feel if this application was granted with a condition, and the condition would be maybe that the doors must be closed and the garden cleared at 10.30. Because if this was a licensing committee, which it is not, that is the question I would be asking, and I would want that. That's certainly something we, sorry, we'd be very happy to, to consider and discuss. Um, the garden has been used regularly since we've been here. As you can see in that photograph, it wasn't because we closed it over winter um, to do some maintenance. Um, but there will be no increase to capacity, and we've had the garden full many times um, over the course of the years. So we're not trying to encourage more use of the garden than we're just simply trying to make it more accessible and also be able to have a visual link so we can manage it in a much better way. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davey. <clears throat> so the, the doors on the picture show kind of French doors coming out of the rear, presumably a level access onto this. So, so, so two questions really, where would the access, would the access for somebody in a wheelchair be through the pub or would it be through the side? Uh, and yeah, what, what kind of what's the access at the moment to, to the rear garden, please? 
At the moment, you have to negotiate steps to get down to the rear garden, so effectively there's no disabled access. Um, the intention is that you will be able to access the garden from inside the pub, but also from outside. There will be a ramp running alongside the existing opening in the wall, um, the, and the gap will be widened to enable um, someone in a wheelchair to be able to access the garden that way. Councillor Jones. Thank you. Can we see the previous picture again, please? The, the gap that looks over the houses to the rear. The photo. No. The, the, the photo from the beer garden. The first photo. The first photo. That's it, thanks. Did you consider other options for screening? Because it seems to me an, an ideal spot to, to, to trellis plants up. I'm sure you have. Was that turned down? Did you, did you have to uh, resort to bamboo planting? Was that the only option available? Our initial application, sorry, our initial application um, had a timber fence directly um, extending the western boundary that you can see there. Um, because we were aware of the concerns of our neighbour at 83 Westbourne Gardens and wanted to address those issues. Um, but it was considered by the planning officer to be incongruous um, in a residential setting um, because, it, because of its height. So we therefore brought the, the, bound, the screening further into the garden to allow it to be reduced slightly. And this is why we, um, we're suggesting the architect and, and, uh, and us together are suggesting uh, the use of bamboo, for instance, is an effective uh, means because it grows so well and is very bushy and, and thick. But we would be happy to consider trellising as well and, you know, or, or a fence behind if, if that would help as well. But I don't know whether that would be suited, you know, whether the planning officer would be happy with that. Okay. Any further questions? Councillor Gilby. Yes, just talking about the dis, you know, disabled and wheelchairs, and you said something about coming in from the gap in the wall. Um, when I was on the site visit, there is a door there um, to the street, but if you'd open that door, which you, you don't appear to, I don't think that when you come in there, it will line up. It won't be level with, with the um, decking that you've got there now. So are you proposing to use that, that door or coming in through the entrance that we went in yesterday? Um, I take it that you're referring to the grey gate that you saw in the far right-hand corner. We don't use that as an access point. That leads directly onto a set of steps, which, again, would be impossible for someone with a, a, a wheelchair or, or other disability to negotiate. Um, and we have suitable access through the way you came in, plus it's easier, easier for us to manage. We wouldn't be able to visually see people coming and going that way. So we, that, that, as part of the application, will be infilled with the rest of the wall. Okay. Any further questions? No. Thank you very much indeed um, for coming along to Planning Committee today. If you'd like to take your seat again. Councillors, are there any questions for Nicola? Mm -hmm. Councillor Davey? Thank you. I, I can't see in there, so apologies if I've missed it. Are there any conditions on timing and... No, there isn't, because as I said in the presentation, it's unrestricted at the moment. It's restricted to the public house opening hours. So we didn't feel there was a difference which warranted the conditions, but obviously if members felt differently, they could impose those conditions. Other questions? No, debate. Anyone like to start the debate? Councillor Hyde. Thank you, um, Chair. Well, yes, this is, this is an interesting one. Um, but I do feel that the patio area will be used much more um, when it is um, updated, shall we say. And I'm pleased to see that there's going to be disabled access. I think that is fantastic. And the bamboo, once established, will be quite a good barrier. But initially, it would be quite sparse. But that's by the way, as long as it improves quite rapidly, I think that's not too bad. I do have concerns about the... Um, doors which could be left open at any hours according to this report um, where currently there are two sealed shut windows and I think with the doors open and the improved patio that they're obviously looking to encourage more people to go into the patio area but I hear what the lady says that it is often 
used. Um, I would be happy to grant this with the condition that the garden is cleared and the door shut by 10.30. Um, this is often what happens in licensing, and I know I say it again, it's not licensing, but those conditions are often placed there to protect the residents. And, and as this is being raised, I think there is a much greater potential for more noise and more people out there. And there's a lot of residents living in very close proximity to this establishment. Um, I feel that the publicans, or whatever you're called these days, sorry, <laughs> the managers, um, are responsible. But it might be that they may not be there forever and other people can come in and this, this planning application will be passed over to them. So I'd be very happy to vote for this application if there was a condition that the doors were shut at half past ten and that the garden was cleared. I think that is fair and reasonable to all. So uh, perhaps we can revive that a bit later after the debate, if I may. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Councillor Theobald, then Councillor Davey. Um, thank you, Chair. Well, I think it, it would be a great improvement for the pub garden area because it's quite dull uh, at the moment um, and it could do with a makeover. Um, and it would be good access for disabled uh, people. But I, I would like to second Councillor Hyde's um, uh, okay. nomination to actually um, uh, put this till 10.30, the garden, because in the report it actually says the pub's open till 12.30. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the people could be left out there till 12.30 at night, and I wouldn't like to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wouldn't like to see the smokers in that area because sometimes it's allowed for smokers to go up, but they can go out the front way instead. Um, so I'd be happy to support this if it has that condition on for the garden hours. Before I call Councillor Davey, then Councillor Cox, can I draw to your attention, Councillor Theobald and Hyde, 5.6 on page 21, which states, if the hours of use of the garden are restricted, the premises license would need to be changed. This would require the license holders voluntarily submitting a minor variation, and so on and so on. Just draw that to your no, attention, and I'll seek. I did read I'll that. I'll seek legal advice. Yeah. yeah. Councillor Davey. Then Councillor Cox. Thank you. I, do, I, do, I don't see why planning can't impose a, an in-use restriction. Thank okay. you, Hilly. Well, I thought we could. <laughs> so, so, so I'd like to. I was drawing the point to okay. Councillor's okay. attention. But, well, I'll, I'll just, just, I, mean, I would like to kind of echo what uh, um, our colleagues have said, and maybe it, should, it could be in, you know, the in-use hours are up till 10.30, and maybe the doors should be kept closed at all times to, you know, to reduce the possibility of noise breakout you know, during the day in general. So, so that's what I would like to propose. But, yeah, other than that, I, I re really welcome this, and, um, yeah, yeah I, I've, I know the pub well, and I've, I've seen it improve and absolutely transform over the last few years, and this seems to be really kind of another positive step forward. So uh, I think those conditions hopefully will provide some comfort to local residents. Okay. Councillor Cox. Yes, as the, as the ward councillor, um, there's, there's no doubt that... Uh, you know, we, we want to see neighbourhood pubs thrive, and um, you know we've we've we, we've got the situation um, elsewhere in uh, elsewhere in the city where uh, pubs like this are shutting down, and it's a cause of um, great great dismay to to people in the neighbourhood. And I, I, sus I suspect there was a fair chance that this place could have gone the way it was being run before the current. Um, Current licensees took, over, took it over because um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the greatest place in the world, and I think it, it, it often had a negative impact on, on neighbours. And, it, and it's clear from what I've seen that the current owners ha, ha, have gone to great lengths to um, be part of the community, and it's good to see it um, thriving as a community asset. Um, having, having said that, I. I also do understand the concerns of, of the people that have spoken today and the, 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 the gentleman who, who lives in the house that we did the, the, the site visit, um, who, who, who understandably are worried about uh, you know, greater use of, of the garden area and, and, and noise and so on, and in particular it becoming a de facto smoking area, which can tend to happen. Um, and I, I do think it's important that there is, there is the, 
10.30 condition and the, the door thing that Councillor Davy suggested. Um, I, without that, I, I would find it difficult to actually support this, but I do want to encourage what the licensee is doing. Um, and clearly, it, 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 is, it is a shame and, and probably wrong if, if disabled people are not able to access the garden in the, in the same way that able people are. So uh, I think it's important that that condition is, is implied, it is imposed. Uh, as, I, as I gather, the committee seems to be minded to, to grant the application in, in general terms. Thank you. Uh, are there any further points in debate? No, before we go to the vote, I'll actually call in Jeanette to actually confirm what wording of this proposed condition from Councillor Hyde that we have. Um, if I understand what you're saying, Councillors, you'd be, you've been discussing an additional condition which would require the garden to be closed and not in use after 10 p.m. every day. Turn, th sorry. It came up, <laughs> both came up, to be fair, sorry. both came Turn, up. 10.30 every day, and the doors, the rear French doors, to be kept shut after that time. I wasn't clear on what you, your discussion was about the French doors. Because you said shot during the day. This is why I sought to clarify. I'm not sure how reasonable shutting during the day is. But... Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> over. Well, I just thought it'd be reason because I'm not, I certainly know instances in, in pubs in the North Lane where there's issues because doors are left open during the day and there's a significant yeah. noise breakout which provides real disturbance. So clearly doors need to be able to be opened <laughs> for people to get in and out. But other than that, I think it's perfectly reasonable that the doors should be yeah, maintained shut. I don't know how one, one, one words that, but be, be closed other than when people are getting in and out of the... <laughs> Do we want to ask the committee members? I take your point, I but I think the North, the North Lanes is a much um, more confined area. This is like, but yeah, perhaps ask the members what they think. Okay. So on, on the basis of Councillor Davies' point about closing throughout the day, when not in use, obviously, would you like to go to a vote on that? Okay. Who, who supports that particular proposal from Councillor Davies? Can we ask what the condition yeah. would be before we vote? The condition is so closed is throughout necessary? the day. Yeah. Well, to, 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 to mitigate noise. To protect the immediacy of local residents. It's worse than COVID. I mean, can there not be noise break at the moment? Yes. There can. However, the windows are sealed closed. The point is that with the addition of the French windows, there would be much, there would be the, the there could be more noise, is the point I think that Councillor Davy is making. Okay, what about to avoid a debate, we say, garden, um, additional condition, the garden to be closed and not in use after 10.30 p.m. every day and the doors to be kept um, in a closed position after that time. No, during the day. Yeah, no, in a closed position during that. Yes. Um, sure, can, I just, can I just ask a couple of questions? I, have to say, I don't know the pub and I don't know what the current situation is, but um, I'm assuming there's currently noise breakout. How would this make it any worse? The windows. There are just two to windows clarify, that are when, closed. when we went on the site visit, it was apparent that the two rear windows at the lower level were fixed shut, yes. and we looked at that quite carefully. So there is a door which accesses the rear garden, which I noted on the site visit. So noise could break out through that existing door, which is serving the garden. However, that door is set further away um, into the rear garden and away from the residential properties than the French doors would be. Is that fair in terms of who did the visit? Yes. Yes, that's, that's what Councillor Davy was saying. Yes. Okay. Shall we have a vote on Councillor Davy's proposal that the door remain closed unless otherwise in use? So are those councillors in favour? Access only. Access only. Yes. Are those in favour? 
six. That's six for and others against. One, two, three, five. Five. five abstentions. Well, there's one councillor missing. So that's been that's been agreed. Okay. If permission is granted. <laughs> okay. So I don't assume that we'll have a vote on your proposal because it was it was yeah. But there's no point because what one would override the other. Okay. Are there any further points of debate? Yeah. Yes. That that condition will be part of the vote that we vote if we decide to vote for this particular application. Any other points of view before we uh, go to the vote? No. Right, this is application BH 2013-03624 for full planning at the Westbourne Public House 90 Portland Road, Hove. The recommendation is to grant with the condition that we have just attached. Can I see all those councillors who would like to grant the application? That's unanimous. There are 11 councillors and one councillor missing. Thank you very much. That uh, application has been granted. Well done to the applicants. We'll move on to item C. This is BH 2013-04102 for full planning at St. Wolfram's Church, Greenways, Oving Dean. Recommendation is to grant uh, the report when I can get a hold of it. Begins on page 39. I'll pass over to Nicola for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. St. Wolfram's Church is a listed building with a graveyard to the western side of Greenways. Um, this is the, the church here. This is Greenways here. This is the existing um, graveyard which is attached to the church at the present. This is a, a closer location plan. So again, this is the church, an existing green, uh, graveyard here. This is an aerial photo which shows the church, the existing graveyard here. And this is the area that's subject to this application. These are some photos which shows the um, existing graveyard, and this is the boundary with the um, proposed graveyard, which is part of the application. This is the view of the proposed graveyard to the northeast. Um, this is a view to the southeast, so this is um, looking towards, um, this is south to the sea. Um, this is the boundary to the existing graveyard, so the alternative photo that I showed you two photos ago, looking back to the graveyard, which is behind these trees. And this is a view from Greenways with the access towards um, the application site. The application relates specifically to the parcel of land that I've shown you in the aerial photograph adjoined to the southern side of the existing graveyard to the south of the church. The land is currently classed as Grade 3 agricultural land and as countryside within the Brighton and Hove local plan. The South Downs National Park adjoins the site to the west and is within the Ovendine Conservation Area. Planning permission is sought to, for the change of use from agricultural land, which is classed as sui generis, to um, burial ground, which is D1. So this site here would become D1 space. Um, 37 letters of objection and a petition of 38 signatures have been received um, of objection, and these are outlined on page 42 of the report. And 33 letters of support have been received and the reasons are outlined on page 42 of the report. Additional comments from internal and external consultees are outlined on page 42 to 44 of your report. The main considerations in the determination of the application relate to the impact of the proposal upon the appearance and character of the site, the adjacent listed building, the Ovendeen Conservation Area and the South Downs National Park. In addition, the impacts upon the amenity of local residents must be assessed as well as ecology, archaeology and transport issues. The site is situated outside the built-up area boundary and designated countryside within the Ovendine Conservation Area. It's designated as agricultural use, although it's currently not being farmed. The supporting documentation accompanying the application states that the existing churchyard is running close to capacity and additional arrangements for burials are a priority. The principle of the use of land as a graveyard is not considered to have a significant adverse impact on the countryside, downland, and the existing use of agricultural land is not specifically protected within the local plan. Burials are proposed to commence adjacent to the western boundary of the site and then progress eastwards over time. The lower eastern end of the site adjacent to the residential gardens is to be set aside as a natural meadow with grassland and wildflowers and will not be used for burials. All flint walls are to be retained with suitable hedging planted where walls are absent. 
It is not considered that the proposal will result in a significant harm to the appearance or character of the site, the setting of the listed church or wider conservation area. The proposed use of the site as an extended graveyard is acceptable in heritage terms, complementing the existing listed church and grounds and will preserve the appearance and character of the conservation area. By leaving the lower section of the site as natural meadow, it will provide visual relief from the graveyard from views from the east and ensure that the area is in use as a graveyard is appropriately scaled. The Heritage Team and English Heritage have no objection to the proposal. Turning to amenity, it is not considered that the proposal would result in a significant harm to the residential amenity of adjoining occupiers. The supporting documentation accompanying the application states that the burial policy will remain unchanged from present, which allows for burials for Ovendine residents and those from elsewhere that have strong links with the church. There is not envisaged to be any increase in the average annual amount of burials, which over the last 20 years has averaged less than 10 a year. The proposed use would not result in a significantly increased noise and disturbance to adjoining properties, and the adjacent properties are set well away from the proposed consecrated area of the site and screened by hedging. There have been a number of objections outlining concerns that a significant increase in annual burials could increase in increased vehicle, vehicular traffic through the village, resulting in noise and disturbance, highway safety issues and increased parking. Whilst the applicant has outlined that they do not envisage any increase in burials, it is not considered that an increase in the number of burials, burials would likely to result in such harm to amenity that would warrant refusal of the application. For the reasons outlined and subject to the conditions on pages 49 to 50, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are two public speakers. Uh, the first is Anthony Canning, if you're here. You're very welcome to Planning Committee. You'll have three minutes. I'll tap the mic when you have 20 seconds left. You can start when you're comfortable. Thanks. I'm Anthony Kenny. I live at Field Ebb with my field end with my wife Jennifer, uh, which is not actually very clearly shown on that block plan. The field in question is 0.93 acres in size and is to the south of the existing graveyard of St. Wolfram's Church, and indeed immediately adjacent to the garden of field end. St. Wolfram's Church bought this field two years ago from the City Council, so doubling the size of its property. This is totally out of proportion for a small 11th century listed building, grade two listed building. St. Wolfram's Church has applied for the whole of this field to be a burial site, which is large enough to accommodate 1,500 bodies. 75 Ovingdean villagers have formally objected to this. 37 have written letters and 38 have signed a petition, mainly because they do not want a huge, in inverted commas, municipal graveyard in Ovingdean, visible from all the way along greenways from the bottom of Ainsworth Avenue to the bottom of Beacon Hill. The upper western 60% of the field, which St. Wolfram's plans to have consecrated for burials at the moment, will last for 220 years at the present rate of burial of deceased Ovingdean residents, two full burials and six burials of cremated remains each year. The objectors do not want St. Wolfram's to have planning permission for burials in the lower eastern 40% of the field now or at any time in the future. We want them to have to apply for planning permission from the City Council if they want to use any of this area for burials. We strongly support the regulatory conditions, item 11.1, paragraphs 3 and 4, which the City Planning Authority intends to impose on St. Wolfram's Church. Biodiversity is currently non-existent in the field because it has been mowed to the ground repeatedly since St. Wolfram's bought it two years ago. All of the birds, animals, bees, butterflies, and wildflowers have been eliminated. We would like the lower 40% of the field to be wild meadow as it was before, and we strongly support the regulatory condition, item 11.2, paragraph 5, which the planning authority intends to impose on St. Wolfram's Church. We would also like a condition which would prevent temporary change of use occurring. We are advised that such a condition might read as follows. Notwithstanding the provisions of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order 1995, Schedule 2, Part 4, Class B, or any reenactment thereof, there should be no temporary changes of use of the land. 
And finally, please stick to your plan not to give St. Wolfram's Church planning permission for burials in the lower 40% of the field now or at any time in the field, in, in the future. Otherwise, St. Wolfram's could arrange consecration and burials in this area at any time without reference to Ovindine Villages or the Brighton and Hove City Council. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? Councillor Hyde. Yes, could you just repeat, you, you spoke of um, the land um, would last 200 years. Which, which, can you just confirm which bit of land you were referring to? Sorry, the upper 60%, which we have reluctantly accepted will be used for burials, um, is, will, will last for 220 years. That's based on calculations. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Chair. Oh, do you want to make sure your mic's on? Thank you. Sorry. Can you turn your microphone off? They only work one at a time. Sorry. Um, I, I see in the objective, Chair. I mean, it talks about this being a municipal graveyard, whatever that means. I would assume it would have been under the jurisdiction of the church, not municipal in any real sense. But it says here, it will serve people immediately outside of the immediate, people outside of the immediate area. So you've said there's so many per year. Presumably you're just basing that on Oban Dean residents rather than people from outside. And wouldn't the church authorities have power to decide who could or couldn't be buried in that churchyard? They may decide, wouldn't they possibly restrict it to Oban Dean residents? That's what they say. Uh, restricted to Oban Dean residents, it will last 220 years. But as I'm sure everybody in this, on this committee knows, there's a terrific shortage of burial sites all over the country, let alone in Ovingdean. And the pressure on the local church to accept people from other parishes will be overwhelming. That is my view. And although we trust the current vicar and we trust the current church wardens, we do not trust future vicars or the future parochial church councils. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions? No. Thank you very much for coming in today. If you'd like to take a seat again. Um, the next speaker is uh, Urit Ulrich. This is the speaker you're representing the agent. We had in front of us previously Jane Jones Warner. Uh, that's right, and that was a, a mistake. Um, ah, it had okay. been already okay. agreed that I would be the person. Brilliant. Okay, you have three minutes, and I'll tap the mic after when, when you have 20 seconds left. Okay. Um, I'm a church warden uh, at St. Wolfram's, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. We are pleased with the officer's report and recommendations and very happy to accept the proposed conditions. We believe this approach should completely allay the concerns of some residents about the scale of burials and the maintenance of the overall appearance and setting of the landscape. Um, referring to particular concerns uh, expressed by Anthony Kenny, we've resisted the suggestion that the lower non-consecrated part of the field should be excluded from the planning application. There are many concerns in Obing Dean, particularly at the present time, about inappropriate developments on pockets of land on the urban fringe. The approach as recommended by the officers protects the whole field from any other possible development, however remote that might be, whilst making the piece of land in its entirety available to the community. You will know from our supplementary statement that we are firmly committed to maintaining and enhancing the natural and traditional appearance of the site through preserving existing trees, planting of appropriate hedging and wildflowers, use of grass paths, and the maintenance of the flint walls. The PCC, that's the council that oversees the church, have already agreed the terms of reference for a group to advise them on landscaping, which will involve local residents and expert advisors. 
Churchyards are very special places which do not just contain graves. Whilst the upper part will be consecrated as a burial ground, it will also provide to the whole community a beautiful and peaceful area open to all for walking, reflection and other community activities appropriate for a churchyard and approved by the PCC. We have been concerned about the divisions this, issues, this issue has created in the community. We are confident that the proposal in the officer's report will resolve those differences in our wonderful village. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, obviously a lot of information passes through my email system on my computer, and I seem to recall, and I was expecting to see it in this report, and this might have to be answered by the officers or the solicitor. Um, I thought sometime when this was all bubbling away, I, saw that, I thought I saw that the church had agreed that, and I note what's in the report here, that they had agreed that it would only be used as a burial ground for Ovingdean residents or those with close connections to, the, to Ovingdean. And with that in mind, in my head, this would have been a condition on this planning application. The real concerns of the residents are, as was mentioned, a municipal graveyard, but an extensive use of this area. Um, and I was reassured that this had no possibility of being the case because it would only, people could only be buried if they'd got connections. And I don't see it anywhere here. And this causes me great concern. So I don't know quite who's going. Perhaps your answer on behalf of the PCC. Thank you. There are three categories under existing burial policy. I mean, our position has always been that the, the existing burial policy will continue, and that's something approved by the PCC and, and by the, the diocese. And there are three categories. Um, that's people living in Ovingdean, people who have a very close connection to the church, might come into the church and so on, or if you died in Ovingdean but didn't have those connections. That is the policy that will continue. We see this as integral to um, what we're talking about here, and, and we'd be very happy to accept that. It would be a continuation of the status quo. Right, thank you for that, because I was going to ask you what guarantee would I have that there wouldn't be a mindset change from the PCC, but um, I'm now going back to the officers here, Anna. Can we finish the questions? Okay, we're going to finish questions to the public speaker first. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Could you tell me how you manage biodiversity in the existing graveyard and what you've done to encourage biodiversity in the existing graveyard? We manage it very carefully. Um, I don't know if you know the graveyard, the most marvelous habitat that you have there in terms of landscape and, and wildlife and so on. And so we, and, and we, we manage it ourselves. Churches don't have lots of money to pay lots of people to do things, but we largely manage it ourselves. Um, uh, we do keep in touch um, with experts. Um, in fact, on the, the, the advisory group we're going to be setting up, uh, there will, will be someone who is from the Overdean Residence Preservation Society. There will be um, a botanist. We are in touch with people like that, and we will continue to be in touch with those people. Um, the only point I would just like to differ from Anthony Kennedy, 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 Kennedy and that was when he said he couldn't see I think we had removed all evidence of birds, bees, and, and wildlife, and so on. I was in, I'm now talking about not the existing graveyard, but the, the, the extended area. Only the other day, I, I'm, I'm regularly there. There's plenty of wildlife there. Um, and uh, I was studying a number of ladybirds just walking along the flint wall in this new field. Um, yes, there was work to be done to get the balance right on the landscape. You have to actually mow very hard to get grass to start growing properly, which it's now doing 
and then we will work away at that landscape um, with experts on our advisory group. So we'll actually have a bit more expertise advising us for the new area than we do at present. Okay. Any further questions? Councillor Theobald. Thank you. Actually, St. Wolfram's used to be my church, and I was actually married there, so I could say I had a connection. But um, uh, I, I um, believe I've been told... So I could be very buried there. But, 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 um, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> um, uh, I believe... I've got the figure down that there could be about 10 burials a year. Is that, uh, that about right? I don't know. I was going to ask the question that if there is a low amount of burials... I presume you would keep up the rest of the land there. There's a, there's a, I believe it's a meadow land, and that would be kept as a meadow land and wouldn't be, you know, be looked after, so to speak. So I was just going to ask that question, really. Uh, yes, um, we, the, the, that figure is simply based... We were asked by the council to provide 20 years of evidence of the burials, and the average is around 10 a year. Uh, and, and we would anticipate our current policy to continue to produce that. I, I mean, there might be a plague, but we are setting aside plagues. Um, we would expect it to continue. So, sorry, and the second part was... Yes, and that, well, it links back to my answer to your other colleague, um, which is we explicitly in our um, supplementary statement with this application gave a commitment to maintaining the quality of that landscape, setting up an advisory group of neighbours and of experts to help us with that task. We want that to look more beautiful than it does now. Okay. Further questions? No. Thank you very much indeed yeah. for coming along today. Um, just in relation to a query that Councillor Hyde raised, if you go to page 48 under 8.14, there is talk in the report about the supplementary planning statement so that the burial policy will remain unchanged from present. So policy allows for burials of Ovingdean residents and those from elsewhere that have strong links with the church. And I think that's what you were trying to... Yes, but I, I, I can't debate. take comfort here. Sorry, you haven't quite finished. Very rude of me to interrupt you. I was very it's eager fine. to get back there. It's I fine. can't take comfort that there won't be changes in the PCC. I think this needs to be conditioned. The main concern of the residents is that this will become a busy cemetery. It's lovely as it is. It's well managed. I agree with all what's been said, and it is very peaceful there. And I feel that the church wants to um, continue in that vein, but they wouldn't be able to. And and you know, everybody wants the money, don't, don't they? Everybody wants the money, and you know, people want to be buried in churchyards. And it would be so easy to take on additional business. Um, and I do have concerns about that. I would like it conditioned, as as is mentioned in eight. Point one four that that becomes a condition. The three issues, you die there, you've got associations there, or you live there. I want to restrict it from becoming a busy graveyard. Uh, I'm not sure it's, it's our place to condition that, if I'm desperately honest. I think this well, let me about, ask Hillary. I think this is about the parish council, and I think it's about, about It's not the, a parish council. About the, about the diocese or the, the sort of the order of the church that makes these rules up. I don't think it's our no, place. Well, maybe not when you've got a planning um, application come in. Maybe that's the time. Over to you, Hillary, please. Um, well, as councillors know, there are very strict tests for conditions. Um, there ha any condition has to be reasonable and it has to be necessary. Um, I mean, it seems to me if, if members are, are agreeable to allowing this application to go ahead with the extent of land proposed, I, I can't see any justification for just restricting the land to, to local people. Um, I, I can't see any rationale there. Sorry. In which case, I won't be able to support this uh, because the, the access to Ovingdean, if you don't come in from the coast road, which is a nightmare because it's all been closed up, access normally is via a, a very narrow lane, Ovingdean Road. The church sits at the bottom of this lane, and if this, and you can, there, there's not a pavement there for people to walk on, and I, it would well, ruin you could it. Just have a, you, you could just have a huge funeral. A huge have, funeral now and again vehicles. is acceptable. You could have huge a huge, huge funeral, you could indeed, and that is acceptable. So that, that's, that's, 
you know, but possibly not acceptable what, what residents don't want, and nor do I, and, uh, you know, nor do I. It, wherever this was, I'd be saying the same. It ha does happen to be in my ward. No, no I understand where Yeah, you're thank you very from. much, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I'm not content that this could suddenly become a very busy graveyard, and I, and I won't support it. And I think I hear what Hillary says, and I respect everything she says. Um, 99.9% .9 of the time I agree with her. I think I'm just that point one at the moment. I'm very unhappy that this could become an exceedingly busy graveyard. This is a village we're speaking of here. The members on the PCC can change. You know, I'm, I'm on a governing body. Okay, but the governing body behaves differently now than it did five years ago when it had different members. The same could be said of the PCC. I want the security, if I can get it, please, okay. that this will not become a busy graveyard. Thank you for listening. Okay. Are there actually any further questions? Well, well in view of what Councillor Harder said, I'm not sure myself whether, in fact, the PCC is entirely responsible for making these decisions, or whether they, in fact, have to adopt a diocesan policy on this matter, because that's obviously would be quite a different thing. Certainly in my own ward, I've got a churchyard, and although there's no actual bodies are buried there now, there are uh, cremated remains are buried there, and they are subject to the same conditions as applying at Oping Dean. So I'm just wondering whether there is a diocese-wide condition, which in fact the PCC couldn't alter anyway. We need to know that, really. There's no particular reason to defer the application. The, profession, the um, report in front of in terms of the report in front of you, we've assessed the planning application and we haven't identified that there is any necessity to condition the, the throughput, the flow of burials into that graveyard, which is what you've identified as your concern. Um, and the position, perhaps you might like to take a vote on whether or not you want to attach this condition. We haven't identified um, we, we haven't identified any particular necessity for the condition in terms of planning um, guidance. We're not entirely sure how we would even enforce the condition. Passport control. So, so are I'm you saying... Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm more than happy to take a vote on that so then we can facilitate further questions and further debate. So if you want to... Yeah, can um, I just add? So, I don't so, know how we're going to enforce it. So, so I've got a report here that is saying that there'll only be 10 burials, which is prepared by our planners here. And now you're telling me this might not be the case. What, what am I supposed to believe? I'm sorry, Jeanette. Are people clear on the proposal from Councillor Hyde? Okay. Can we see all those councillors who... I'm not clear on what councillor... Can, can you ask her to articulate this condition? Yeah. Sorry, councillor Wells, we'll come to you in a second. Councillor Hyde, would you like to reaffirm... Yes, I would, and I think... ...of what you're trying to get at? Yes, I, because of my concerns that this could become a busy graveyard, which would be totally inappropriate to the village of Ovingdean, I'd like to condition what is mentioned in 8.14, which comes from the PCC. Uh, it's here. Why, why put it in if we're not going to adhere to it? You know, it's like saying, well, I give planning permission for six-story block of flats, and then somebody's saying, well, we might put seven. You know, I have to believe what I see in the report. Yes. Yes. And, and uh, Councillor um, Wells has just put his hand up to second. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. I think Hillary um, just disappointed. Yeah, you just, just a point. I mean, what, what exactly do you mean by a busy graveyard? And is there an issue here where perhaps Steve Shaw could come in? Because I think the sustainable transport mentioned, you know, up to 10. I mean, would there be any transport issues if there were more than 10 burials per year? If it were exceeded greatly, obviously I've seen the traffic report. The, the, the traffic division doesn't have any problem with this because they too are reading this and seeing that there's only 10. But if, if there were a lot more, and I, I'm not quite sure how familiar um, our transport um, officer is with the lane that accesses the church as you go down there. But there's a nursery school there. You know, people live there. There's no pavement. Oving Dean is not an appropriate place for a busy graveyard, and that's it. And I'm afraid you can't budge me. The question is whether how we define busy. Shirley, Steve, I don't know if you've got... 
Um, yes, it is very subjective, the issue. I mean, what is a busy graveyard? Um, I mean, all I can really do is reiterate, reiterate our point that we don't see that this is going to be a, a significant increase. There's no reason in front of us that there is going to be, I mean, it's been 20 years, average fewer than 10 burials per year. We don't see that there's any reason or necessary to put a restriction on um, this permission that would limit the number of burials that can take place any year or over time. It just isn't necessary to make the application acceptable in transport terms. Therefore, that's why we haven't put forward a recommendation to limit the number of burials. That's all really I'm, what I can say on the matter, that we don't think it's necessary to have a condition that limits the number of burials that take place. Yeah. Then, Thank you. Did, did you base your comments on the fact that in this report it says 10 burials a year? Is that what you based your comments on? We will have based our comments on the local situation, obviously taking account of the local area and the, the, the road network around there, but also it will have been based on the fact that over the past 20 years, yes, there have been a low number of burials per year. That potentially could change, but even so, I don't feel it's necessary to put a restriction on there that limits the number of burials per year, because it's not going to be significant huge amount that would cause traffic chaos in the area. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lutman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, appropriate, but I'd like to speak against the suggestion of putting this uh, uh, restriction on. I think St Wolfram's has been there for the best part of a thousand years. ACC and its <coughs> sorry, the, the same St Wolfram's has been there for the best part of a thousand years. The PCC and its predecessors have managed it for all that time, managed the graveyard um, without the interference of the secular authorities. And I don't think now is the time to do it. I take, I take your point, but they had a small graveyard and now they've got a big graveyard. Okay, right. I think we've got defined positions on either side of the bait. I'm now just going to move to the vote. Who, from the proposal from Councillor Hyde, seconded by Councillor Wells, that we put the point on 8.14 on page 48 into a condition? Who is for that proposal? Can you please put your hand in the air? And who's against? Yeah. So that, that's fair debated. Right. Are there any further questions at this stage? Councillor Gilby, please. Yes, I just wanted to know in 11.4 11, 11 on page 49 about the non-consecrated section of the approved drawing in revision D. It says, shall not be used for burials and shall remain free from development. Now, will that be forever or can that be changed by another planning application, the free from development part? It can be changed. It's, nev yeah. it's never it's going to be forever. Yeah, uh, because it's a condition, it would have, they would have to apply to vary the condition, so it would be a formal application that would be submitted. It would be subject to consultation with the neighbours in the same way that this application was submitted. So it's, it's not a never-never, but obviously they'd have to apply and go through a formal process. Okay. Further questions? No. Right, let's move to debate. Anyone? Councillor Hyde? No. <laughs> I think I've said it all, thank you, Great and I will, I will not support this application for the reasons given. Like you've previously outlined, of course. Any further points in debate? No, let's move to the vote. This is application BH 2013-04102 for full planning at St. Wolfram's Church, Greenways, Ovingdean. The recommendation is to grant, can I say all those councillors who would like to grant the application? I think it's eight, actually. Six, nine, nine. nine. I do apologise. And others against? Yeah. Two. And a, an abstention, presumably? One absent. No. One absent. Okay. One absentee. Okay. Um, we will move on to the third application today, which is BH 2014-00433. This is 17 Old Shoreham Road, Hove. The recommendation is to refuse, and the report begins on page 65. I'll pass over to Nicola for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The application site relates to a two-storey detached building which is located on the north side of Old Shoreham Road in Hove. The building is used as a care home for people with dementia 
It's currently registered for up to 12 residents. So this is the site here. This is a photo from the front from Old Shawn Road looking onto the site. This is a view of the rear garden from the um, fire escape. This is a view from the rear garden looking to the rear elevation of the property. And again, the rear elevation. And this is a view from the side. Here, this is an access which runs along the, the garden. This is um, a view of the application site with number 15, Old Shawn Road here. And this is a view from the rear of the property looking, looking north. This is a view from the side looking towards number 15. And this is a view close to the rear elevation looking at number 15, Old Shawn Road. These are the windows and doors referred to in the report, which we'll go on to shortly at number 15. And then this is the application site looking to number, towards number 19. So this is the existing ground floor. Um, it's traditionally appearance with a brick and render appearance. The report inaccurately advises that the windows are wood encasement windows. However, the windows are critical. The house has been extended previously, including a large roof extension to allow additional accommodation in the roof space and a two-story flat roof extension adjacent to the western boundary. So this is the existing first floor and existing second floor. In terms of elevations, this is the front and the rear side facing east and side facing west. And this is the proposed extension. It um, will increase the capacity of the care home by adding eight ensuite bedrooms. The extension will be L-shaped, it includes a central landscaped area, and the extension will be single storey and have a pitched roof. Letters of objection have been received from the adjoining residential occupiers, and the reasons for objection are outlined on page 68 to 69 of the report. A letter of support has also been received from councillors Brown and Bennett. This is reproduced on page 78. An email of support has also been received from the applicant, which seeks to address some of the objections received. The correspondence does not address the concerns raised by the local plan authority, which will be addressed later. So if I can run through the plans, this would be the proposed ground floor. So this is the extension as proposed. This is the central courtyard, and this is the main existing house here. This is the first floor. So this is the extension as proposed. Second floor and roof plan. This is the front elevation, rear elevation, so this is the extension. The side elevation, which would be the appearance from number 15, Old Shawn Road. And this would be the view onto the courtyard, um, as you would see from the access, which leads to 17A and along 19, Old Shawn Road. This is a section through the rear part of the L-shaped extension. And this is an extension at this element here. And this is as proposed. Internal consultee responses are outlined on page 69 of the report. The main considerations in the determination of the application relate to the principle of the additional residential care facilities, the design and appearance of the proposed development, impact on residential amenity, transport, highway concerns, and impact on trees and sustainability. Policy H011 of the Brighton Hove Local Plan allows extensions to residential care and nursing homes, providing a number of criteria are met. The four criteria are outlined on page 71 of the report, and whilst the scheme is considered to accord with criteria C and D, there are concerns in respect of criteria A. Planning Commission is sought for an ex a significant extension to the building to allow additional accommodation. The extension would add an additional 24 metres in length to the rear of the building, would be L-shaped, would accommodate eight additional bedrooms, and given the top topography of the site, the scheme would require the partial dipping out of the garden to allow for the proposed development. In terms of design, the extension is considered excessive in size. The existing building has a length of 10 metres, and the resulting extension would add an additional 24 metres in length. This is more than twice the length of the existing building, and more than double the existing ground floor space. Whilst the extension would not be visible from the street, the extension, due to its size, would significantly detract from the character and appearance of the host property and surrounding area and is considered contrary to the advice containing SPD 12. The proposed extension would dominate the rear garden, would not be sympathetic or subordinate addition to the main building. The elongated appearance of the extension would comprehensively jar with the appearance of the host building and would form an inappropriate and incongruous addition. In addition, the extension will be out of character with the residential built form of the area and the relationship between built form and garden space that characterises the surrounding area. Turning to amenity, the proposal would affect the immediate adjacent properties to the east and westmost. 
Due to the position, positioning of the site, the proposal would not significantly affect the amenities of properties to the north and south. And given the separation to number 19 by a narrow driveway, together with the position of the extension, the proposal is unlikely to have a detrimental impact on those occupiers. In terms of number 15, the proposed extension would project in close proximity to the joint boundary and the side windows and three glazed doors fronting onto the common boundary, which I showed you in the photo earlier. The proposed extension would have some impact on these side windows. However, it should be noted that the two windows would be affected by the proposal, serve a garage and a small utility room, um, and they also serve a kitchen, which has rear-facing windows. Windows in the proposed extension would face onto these. However, suitably worded conditions could require the proposed windows to be obscurely glazed in the event planning commission was granted. The extension would project into the rear garden by 24 metres. Whilst the extension is unlikely to have a detrimental impact on these side windows, which front face onto the application site, there are concerns regarding the excessive depth of the extension and the resulting bulk and increased sense of enclosure of the neighbouring occupiers. And it would have a unneighbourly impact on the occupiers of number 15. Whilst the extension would provide eight additional spaces for quality care provision for people with dementia, this provision is supported in principle. However, the benefits of the scheme do not outweigh the concern raised by the scale of the development and its impact on the appearance of the host property and the resulting impact on neighbouring amenity. For the reasons outlined, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Yeah, before I call the speakers, Jeanette, just as a point of clarification. Mm -hmm. Uh, councillors, we did a site visit yesterday and we paced out 17 metres to, uh, as a rear extension yesterday on the site visit. The extension is 24 metres long, so we paced out 17, so an additional seven, seven. paces beyond that, just for cla to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are two speakers, the first of which is Councillor Ken Norman, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you. You're very welcome to Planning Committee, Councillor Norman of three minutes and I'll tap the mic when you have 20 seconds left. Thank you Chairman. I'll first explain why I'm here and not the councillors for the ward and they are otherwise engaged in, on other duties um, so they've asked me to represent them but I'm here to, to give their views and not necessarily mine Chairman. Um, and they are both in favour of this development um, for, for various reasons um, and I, one thing I would like to point out in, in favour of this uh, development is that there are a number of things over, the, over recent years in back garden developments that have probably far exceeded this type of, of development in this, in this particular application. Um, indeed, in, I represent with Dean Ward, which is adjacent to Hope Park Ward, um, some, uh, some way off the development I'm just about to mention, but recently a, a similar enlargement of a back garden development like this for student accommodation was approved in with Dean Ward. So, I, you know, to say that um, this is overdevelopment on this particular site, I think is really a bit, uh, a bit fanciful. So, um, my reasons for being here, as I say, are to support councillors Bennett and, and uh, Brown. And I do think that this application, although it appears on the face of it to be rather substantial, um, we are in this city in dire need of extra accommodation for, for people with both dementia and learning disabilities and other disabilities in the city. Um, we are indeed short of those sort of facilities and we do want to bring people in uh, uh, residents that are outside the city at the moment back into the city for their care uh, and protection. And so um, I think that really wraps it up, um, Chairman, for me. Um, um, I'm sorry I can't go on for three minutes, but I think I've made, put my views in a nutshell and those of the two councillors of the ward. Thank you very much for your brevity, Councillor. Are there any questions for Councillor Norman? Councillor Davey. Thank you, uh, Councillor Norman. Um, I thought, I'm sure I remember many uh, t occasions when the, uh, back land development has been argued against. I just wondered if you could ex um, explain why you think this should be an exception to objections to back land development in, on, in, on garden side. I'm not saying it should be an exception, Councillor. I'm saying uh, it should be uh, examined in in the similar needs or the similar on similar app past applications that have been approved uh, for such developments in back gardens um, and so therefore I'm not picking any one out or any one application out um, to compare but in my time on the, on the planning committee you know I'm not on the planning committee at the moment but I do substitute sometimes um, 
applications such as this for private development and uh, for, for, as I've already said, one in Wood Dean Ward for, which is going to be student occupation um, in a, attached to a private house, um, has been allowed to go through. Um, and I can't see any difference on this one. If those can be uh, allowed through, then I don't see any problem with this one. I have to say, my personal view is that uh, possibly it's too much, but my, my colleagues who he I'm here to represent uh, would like to see this application approved. Thank you. Further questions? No? Okay, great. Councillor Norman, if you'd like to take your seat again. Thank you very much. Um, the next speakers are Peter Mallinson and David Camp. Is one of you speaking and one of you coming forward to... Okay. We'll divide the time equally. Do you want us to stop after a minute and a half for you, or are you just happy to kind of do it among yourselves? Okay. That's fine, as long as you're both okay with that arrangement. That's fine. I'll tap the mic when you have 20 seconds left, but you're, you're ready. When you're comfortable, you can start. My name's uh, Peter Mallinson. I'm director of Locksford House. I've run Locksford, commonly known as Locksford, uh, since the 19th of August 1985. Primarily looked after people with learning disabilities, uh, some of which went on to, to develop dementia. Over the last couple of years, um, I was made aware both with meetings uh, within the council and, and also uh, the national press that there was a great need for looking after people with dementia. Um, I've joined the Dementia Challenge. My mother died of dementia. And this uh, garden is very underused as it is, and I believe that um, uh, the architect's done very well to, to fit it in within the, the area. So that's me. Okay. Um, uh, Lockswood House has originally a family house, and, but has been a care home for many years. The applicant owner, Mr. Mallinson, has intentionally maintained Lockswood as traditional looking house inside and out, as it is literally a home for its residents. The garden is very large and raised up by about one metre. It is bounded to the west by a privately owned driveway to a rear property. The owner is happy to give controlled access to the construction vehicles to enable this build. There is an owner at number 19 further to, to the west beyond the driveway who is therefore separated by two sets of walls. The owner to the east at number 15 is in a relatively modern house with a shallow pitched roof built about one metre from the garden wall. The roof slope includes a dormer which overlooks Loxwood. They have screened their garden from overlooking by planting Leylandii which are high and dense. The single storey rear extension links to the main house with a pitched roof which essentially mimics the profile at number 15. The new extension links onto Loxwood at the same level and maintains this level throughout. This is to ensure ease of access for residents and staff. It is important to note that the garden is to be excavated by about one metre, thus keeping the building lower than it would otherwise be and discreet in its setting. It does not overlook nor overshadow any adjacent property, therefore cannot be considered unneighbourly. There are two main areas of outside space formed. One is the uh, courtyard with the sensory garden and at the, and at the rear the residual lawn which is still a reasonable size. You will have noticed there, is a, there was a general buzz of traffic noise in the garden during your site visit. The courtyard will help to baffle some of the noise and certainly traffic noise reaching the rear lawn area should be much diminished. The rooms in the extension are to the current standard and include wet room en suites which helps to maintain the hygiene and dignity of residents in their own space. It is an eight bedroom extension, but as one room is lost to the new reception area, the aggregate gain to Loxwood is actually seven bedrooms. Finally, you will have noticed several of the current residents in the course of your visit sitting quietly in the lounge and otherwise in the home. Any suggestion that objectors have made that the residents will make noise that is intrusive or persistent is clearly misplaced. Their condition does not diminish the, the respect time. to which they're entitled, which Mr. Mallinson and his staff give them. Thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any questions? Councillors? No. no. Not, Councillor Davey. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Mr. Kemp, can you turn off your microphone so Councillor Davey will have to do ping pong here? Sorry. Councillor Davey. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, must, I find this very difficult, actually. Yes. Um, 
Given, given the fact that presumably this is a greenfield site, I just wondered whether you considered a, a kind of a, a more ecological uh, development, something which, which might be of a, of a higher uh, sustainability category, and possibly with a green roof or, so, or something like that. I just wondered why you chose this particular design. Uh, well, largely because it was uh, one that would mimic the um, house next door and was kind of an appropriate space. It created nice, nice big spaces inside that were um, actually to the exact size within a few square millimetres of, of what the standard is for each room. So allowing for the number of rooms you have to add to make the proposition viable in the first place, we've endeavoured to keep the number of um, the, the overall size of the development to a reasonable footprint. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Any further questions? No. Thank you both very much. If you'd like to take your seat again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Councillors, are there any questions for Nicola? Yeah, yeah, Nicola, please clarify. I'd just like to clarify a point what was raised by Councillor Norman in reference to um, an application in the Withdean Ward at Red Hill Drive. Um, that extension was deemed acceptable by officers, um, unlike this particular scheme. I can clarify that that extension was not proposing an, a depth of 24 metres on the back of the property. Mm -hmm. It was substantially reduced in terms of its scale, um, and therefore um, there are... Um, differences between the two. I'm sorry, Councillor, I assumed you meant that one on Red Hill Drive. Um, you said it was for student accommodation. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you, Councillor Norman. Councillor Norman, um, apologies. Nicola's very, very familiar with quite a lot of the, the permissions that are going through in that part of the city. We've assumed you were referring to that. If not, we, we withdraw the comment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Hyde, did you have a thank question? Thank you. Yes, could, could I just see the slide again of the east elevation, please? I'm mean, look, looking to... Um, some of the reasons and objections. There, one of the things mentioned was um, light breakout, and I just wondered um, what light breakout there is likely to be. And it's those four windows, isn't it? Right, thank you very much. Okay, further questions? Councillor Gilby. Yes, on the site visit, when it was paced out at 17 metres, <laughs> um, and therefore, we might have got sort of the wrong sort of perspective on it. How, how much lawn is left? Because, I mean, it's a huge garden, isn't it? So I just wondered how much lawn is actually left after, you know, the 24 metres. That distance there to that distance there is 15 metres. Okay. Further questions for Nicola? 
Councillor Davey. So, um, with regard to the fact that it's a backland development, you know, a rear garden development, and it's an extension, so how does that differ from um, a separate building with regard to levels of sustainability requirements? The SPD talks about new buildings and obviously if it was a new dwelling in the back garden then we would expect it to meet certain credentials but because it's an extension to the building it doesn't fall within the SPD criteria so that wouldn't fall as part of the considerations. Okay and, and so, so, so one of the, 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 the main objections to this seems to be the size of it so uh, is the exact size so is it possible to say well if it was this X length, that would be okay. <laughs> and what is X if that is the case? In terms of, we did have pre-application advice with the applicants and we did ask for a substantial reduction in terms of the scale of the extension. Um, I haven't got a figure in my mind what depth would be okay. Um, but obviously, um, it's 24 metres of depth is, is just too much. And it's disproportionate to the original building and the footprint of that. Okay. Further questions, Councillor Theobald? I was just picking up in the report, the arborecologist here, about the trees in the front are not actually mentioned in this application, but do you know what trees are going to go from the front of the, this application? Are you referring to paragraph 8.23 on page 74, yeah? Which is where and which is front. We'll just get out the arboriculturalist report and confirm for you. Do you be able to put that on the projector, please? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, in terms of the trees, um, there's three apple trees to be felled, which are located here. And that's, that's the apple trees. And then there's a tree, this tree is to be felled as well here for the development. So there's three apples to be removed from the front. Hello. 
Okay. What further questions? Councillor Wells. Thank you, Chairman. Could I just ask Nicola to show me the the oh, yeah. pic, the photograph, uh, which of the neighbouring house? I think it's number fifteen. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Further questions? No. Would anyone like to start a debate? Councillor Wells. <laughs> Jeff, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, looking at this picture in particular, because on the site just visit yesterday, um, it, that, to the left of that picture, you can just see the Leylandi trees and. Uh, I would have thought if there was a, an issue there, um, it would be the trees, albeit they are in the, that neighbouring property, in the garden of. Um, this extension is going out 24 metres, which I thought may be a little bit too long, considering that yesterday we were told 17 metres. But the height of it, I don't think would have any detrimental effect with respect to light on that property there because then I didn't see them as rooms that were habitable like would be a lounge or even a bedroom and I think one's a garage and one was referred to as a sewing room but it looked like a utility room to me um, I seem to remember some years ago about a hundred yards away from this building as the crow flies in the upper drive some blocks of flats were built Joining uh, uh, yes, Eubanks properties. A couple of properties were uh, demolished there, and uh, blocks of flats were built, which, to my mind, would have would have cut cut off a lot more, hell of a lot more light to neighbouring properties there. Um, I welcome the fact that uh, we we um, uh, welcome the scheme to provide additional spaces for quality care in this city but I don't think it would have too much this building considering that it would be excavated out by as was pointed out about a metre I don't think it would have a great deal of impact on the neighbouring property um, so there would be li little or no loss I don't think there would be any loss if any uh, of light or to that neighbouring building and um, for that reason, I think I'll, I'll go along with and uh, support this application. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Wells, Councillor Cox. You OK? Debate, Councillor Hyde. Yes, this is, this is a very difficult one. Um, I appreciate it's a massive extension. It's even bigger than I thought it was. I was quite, we won't mention that again. Um, uh, and I, I was content with the fact that there was, were reasonably content with the fact that there was a substantial amount of garden remaining. And um, there, yes, and it is big and it's not ideal, but there will still be some garden remaining, I think about 45 feet in English. Um, oh, it is St George's Day actually, but that's immaterial. But <laughs> um, And the fact that it is going to be excavated and there's a, is it a mono pitch roof it's not it's not a high pitch roof and i agree with countless we sound like we're in league today but we're, we're not really um i agree that it won't impact number 15. i mean I, I did make quite an issue of looking through that awful 70s block paving wall and I could see that one of the windows was a garage and the other was um, a, a utility room. Um, and, it, and it cannot, can't, it's borderline. It can't be viewed from the road, which is a plus for me. I don't think it will affect the neighbours. It is large and I can quite understand why the offer is there for refusal. But the bottom line for me is that the social benefits of the scheme outweigh the, the size, which I would like to see less of, um, outweigh it for me. I think the social benefits of the scheme 
are really, really important. Um, and when we went into the establishment yesterday, albeit it's not a planning consideration, but it appeared to me to be well run. We've got a shortage of space. I hear, and I didn't give this any consideration until I listened to what Councillor Norman said, that we're looking to bring of some of our placements which are outside of um, the city, much the same as foster children sometimes have to go outside of the city. Um, additional beds mean that we can bring them back in, and that's of great benefit to, to the relatives. Um, and because of the reason given, and I'll reiterate, it is very borderline, it is very large, which, but the social benefits for me do outweigh the disadvantage, so I will be supporting this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jones, then Councillor Lettman. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a difficult one. I, I'm really sympathetic to the applicants. Um, I have a parent in a dementia care home, and we couldn't find anywhere suitable in Brighton to place my father. We, we are going to need more and more care spaces in the city. Um, I see that one of the objectors talked about, you know, this, this will not be, it, it will not be possible to turn this back to a, a family home. I don't, I, I think it's very unlikely that any existing dementia care home is ever going to be turned back to a family home because we need more and more spaces. Um, I know this is a mixed-use home. So I, I do think it's an overdevelopment of a site. I would have liked to have seen a, a different scheme here, um, but then there are economics and economies that, that are at play here, and the, uh, the applicant does have to get a return, and this is going to cost a lot of money. Therefore, it ha I think it has to be a fairly large scheme. I, I still haven't made my mind up. Um, I'm trying to weigh this up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lepman. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo a number of things that have been said. Uh, I am by no means a fan of building on back gardens. I think it's in, in, in sorry, it's a general rule. It's very rare for me to be considered to be quiet, Valerie, but sorry. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, I generally um, oppose building on back gardens. However, the city, along with the country, is facing a dementia time bomb at the moment. We have nothing like the provision that we're going to need. Um, and as uh, Councillor Norman said, we do, we, you know, our, our policy is predicated on bringing people back into the city. Um, the, the fact is, yes, this may cause some disturbance to the neighbours. We have to bear in mind the residents of this care home could be any of us. Dementia doesn't care and it, 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 it will strike at anybody. I, I, I agree it's large, I agree it's not perfect, but I think the social benefit outweighs the, uh, the problems with it, and I am going to support it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Theobald, then Councillor Cox. Um, I, said anything. Um, I know we, we need more light care home facilities, um, but I'm quite astounded by the size of this because, you know, the house is 170 square metres and this would go to 240 square metres, which is rather big. I don't think we've ever had anything as long as this, you know, this application like this. So, you know, I have difficulty in, in putting my mind around uh, this because it is a residential area and, um, you know, it, the garden actually is quite nice and there'll be a lot of trees as well there. So I'm not sure about this one. I have to think about this. Thank you. Councillor Cox? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the reason I didn't speak earlier was I wanted to actually hear what some other people um, had to say because I, I've also been mulling over this very carefully. And I was very struck with what Councillor Jones said um, about it doesn't, doesn't think any you know, dementia homes would shut. In fact, we've had two, to my knowledge, shut in Westbourne. And and there's, I'm aware of a proposal to shut another one um, because they're, they're not economically viable under the new rules where you've got to, you know, un understandable rules where, you, you know, people have to have their own bathrooms and so on. And so you then get presented with this problem we've, which we've got here today, which is, is, is a, something that does on the face of it seem too big, but by doing it like that, it then becomes viable and the residents can all have their own bathrooms and comply with all the all the commendable rules. But I was also struck by what Councillor Wells said, referring to there are, within a very short distance of here, a number of places where houses like this have been knocked down, 
and, um, and replaced with either new modern homes or often um, medium-sized blocks of flats. And you know, part of me could almost see a more acceptable proposal to knock this down and turn it into a you know, medium-sized dementia home but purpose-built as opposed to the rather odd situation we've got here, which is a large family home with a huge, long, low, not particularly environmentally friendly extension. So I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking out loud here, really, but it, it, is, it is very difficult because I do rec recognize the need for this provision. But I don't know at the moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further points in debate? Councillor Gilby. Yes, thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I did go on the site visit, um, and I was concerned about the number 15 and the closeness of the windows. Um, but I, I see in 8.14 that, you know, that it says it would not directly affect those windows, and we did look through their wall. But I do also notice that in 8.15 that it actually says, you know, that um, if a you know, condition could be recommended requiring a screen to be attached to the relevant section of the boundary wall to cover the gaps in the breeze blocks, and I, I would very much, you know, appreciate that, that that would be done as a condition. Um, I think because when we were on the site visit, we didn't think it was going to be quite as big as it was, which is why I asked about how much room is left because it is a very, very big garden. And, and, I, and I do agree it is overdevelopment, but I think it's done quite sympathetically in a way, you know, to, to mirror what's next door. Um, but along there, there are all different shapes and sizes and, um, and it won't be viewed from the road. So, you know, it's, I, I'm finding it very difficult too, but I'm almost erring on the side of um, supporting the application. Thank you. Councillor Davey. <laughs> I thought it would be fair. It is, I think, I think I'll, I'll concur, it is exceedingly difficult. Um, I am very sympathetic with the need for this. Uh, personally, I do think it is too big. And I, do, and, and, and I think some, sometimes you know, trying to fit in is not always the best approach. And so I would like to see somewhat slightly different, some, a, a, a slightly different, a slightly smaller development with a possibly less sympathetic approach, which actually is an interesting piece of architecture and has a high degree of sustainability. And I, must, I don't know what the economics of, of this business is, so I can't, I can't really comment on that. Um, yeah, so I can't comment on what they need to um, secure to make this viable, so I'm not able to consider that. So I think I can only really consider the architectural aspects of it. Um, and yeah, I think it is too big and it's the wrong um, kind of design for me personally. Okay, thank you. Further points in debate? No, I'll add my top ends. Um, I agree with you, Councillor Davey. I think on the one hand we need facilities, of course we do. We're all very well aware of the pressures in adult care and health, never mind budgets, um, problems, serious problems that we face like dementia. But I have a big problem with uh, the extension and the size of it. I have a real concern about Never mind today's amenity for number 15, what about future amenity, which we have to draw into uh, consideration when we think about uh, planning applications. And quite frankly, that blank wall, 24 metres length of just a bland wall with two windows in it is really not um, very inspiring architecture whatsoever. I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily that fussy about whether or not I can see it from a public place. This is about what buildings we, um, we give approval for in the city, and I just think it's, it's dull architecture. Um, I'm concerned about the amenity of neighbours, so I'm afraid I will not be voting um, for this particular application. Are there any further points in debate? Can I say something? Yes, you can, Jeanette. Um, just wanted to say, councillors, there's no in principle objection to the extension of the property, just to be clear on that. In terms of um, viability, the applicant hasn't actually discussed or put a case to us in terms of the viability and the requirements for this. Um, that's not part of the submission. And um, I just wanted to say that um, I know you know this, and I know this is a very difficult decision for you. It's not a relevant material consideration to say that it could be any of us who needs the services of a property in this use at a later time in our life. Just want to point that out before you vote. Thanks. Okay. 
<laughs> Would anyone like to add anything further before we go to the vote? Okay. Um, right, this is BH 2014-00433 for full planning at 17 Old Shoreham Road, Hove. The recommendation is to refuse. Can I see all those councillors who would like to refuse the application? Seven. That's seven. Thank you. And all those who would prefer to grant four. And Councillor Duncan isn't here, so that particular application has been refused. I'm very sorry for the applicant there. Um, please come back because actually we understand the need for the facilities and we understand as well that you've been having that particular place and that has worked for your client so far and we want, we want you to be successful fundamentally Mr Mullins and come back and have a conversation with the planners and I wish you luck with that genuinely in the future. Thank you. Um, we will move on. Um, the next application is BH 2014-00294 for householder planning consent at 39 to 40 Kings Road, Brighton. The recommendation is to refuse and the report begins on page 97. I'll pass over to Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. The application site is located in a very prominent location in the Old Town Conservation Area on the corner of Kings Road and Ship Street, which faces the seafront. So this is the application site here. The buildings form part of an attractive group of Victorian buildings on the seafront block between Ship Street and Middle Street that are usually largely unified by the presence of timber sash windows. The buildings are considered to make a positive contribution to the special appearance and character of the Old Town Conservation Area. This is the photos the front of the site. This is a photo in context with the buildings next door. This is the application site. This is Ship Street here. And this is fronting onto Ship Street. This is the existing front elevation. The relevant history is outlined in section three of the report. An application was allowed at appeal for the replacement of sash windows and frames to the south and east elevations with, with UPVC windows um, in 2001. Permission is now sought for the replacement of the existing timber sash windows with UPVC sash windows on the first, second, third and fourth floors to the south and eastern elevations. So this is existing, and this is the existing side elevation. This is the proposed front and proposed side. Ten letters of support have been received and are outlined on page 100 of the report and a letter of objection has been received which is also outlined on page 100. The main considerations of the determination of the application relate to the visual impact of the proposed alterations to the host buildings, street scene and wider Old Town conservation area. In addition, any impacts to the amenities of neighbouring properties shall also be assessed. The approval granted at appeal was not implemented and since this approval, both national and local policy have changed. Policy has changed nationally with the publication of the MPPF. In addition, local policy has changed with the adoption of the Brighton Hove Local Plan 2005. And additionally, SPD 09 and SPD 12. The proposal to replace all of the windows which are visible to the southern and eastern elevations with UPV sash windows on the first, second, third and fourth floor levels is com considered contrary to the requirements of policy HE6 and SPD 09. Um, the SPD09 states that replacement windows must closely match the originals in their style, method, opening proportions and external details. Um, and it also says that the document says that on street elevations the original materials must also be matched, which, which this scheme would not do. The submitted drawings show that the proposed windows would broadly match the portions of the existing windows and would retain the existing glazing pattern. However, the use of UPVC inevitably provides a thicker appearance to the window frames and has a harder appearance than the existing paint and timber. In addition, the incorporation of standard double glazing creates a different reflective appearance than the traditional single glazing to the building. To conclude, the replacement windows will be contrary to SPD09 and policy HE6 of the Brighton Hove local plan. The proposed UPVC windows would not match the existing material and the subtle appearance timber provides. In addition, the windows would not match the existing joinery details of the sash windows and may result in the further loss of architectural detailing through the loss of the original timber. The use of UPVC is an unsynthetic material which would harm the appearance of this historic building and in turn would harm the special character and appearance of the Old Town Conservation Area contrary to the guidance in the MPPF. 
the reasons outlined, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, David Wilde and Simon Barham, you're very welcome to Planning Committee. Are you going to be sharing the three minutes? Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Barham. Um, I think you know the drill. Good afternoon. The application before you is for the replacement of failing timber windows with new double glazed UPVC sliding sash units. The new windows are needed because despite regular maintenance, the existing softwood windows are simply not resilient enough to provide for adequate weather protection. This has led to water penetration that is having a significant impact on the quality of life of residents within the building. And this is evidenced by the letters of support for the proposals that have been submitted by local residents. We're surprised at the negative recommendation for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is clear that an appeal against the refusal of permission for plastic windows was allowed in 2001. The committee report places little emphasis on this appeal decision because the council has not retained a copy of the appeal decision. Given that councils have a statutory duty to maintain a register of planning decisions, this approach is not reasonable. Secondly, the recommendation is based on the consultation response from the heritage team, but the heritage team's comments are not consistent with what was said back in 2001 and also contain inaccuracies. With regard to the 2001 application, the heritage team said that it would consider plastic windows acceptable if they included features such as horns to the sash frames, putty lines, white seals, and no inward opening facilities. Notwithstanding that the subsequent appeal was allowed, it should be noted that the current proposals make provision for all these features. The heritage team comments on the current application do not appear to have been made with a full understanding of the plans. The comments refer to a concern that the horns to the windows might be stuck on. This is not the case. Run-through horns are proposed, and this is confirmed in the application documentation. The heritage team also refers to dormer windows, but the submitted plans clearly show that the dormer windows are already made from plastic and our existing windows are not part of the proposals. The negative recommendation places little emphasis on the quality of life of the building's residents, who have clearly stated their need for better weather protection in what is a very exposed location. The new windows will give such protection, as well as being more sustainable with regard to related factors such as heat loss. The windows have been designed to use in heritage locations and full details have been provided in the submitted plans and design and access statement. These details show that the proposed windows can be successfully integrated within traditional buildings and conservation areas, especially one where there are already many pro properties in the area with plastic windows. Given the above and the ability to impose conditions such as prior approval of cross sections to ensure the correct positioning of windows within the reveals, we respectfully request that permission be granted so these urgent works can commence. Thank you very much indeed. Councillors, questions? Councillor Cox. Um, do, do you have the report in front of you? Can I refer you to paragraph 8.13? As you can see, we, we are being advised as members of the committee by the officers that re replacement windows manufactured in timber uh, can be effectively be just as good. Um, why, why can't you replace these windows with, um, with timber ones? It's primarily a question of maintenance, and I think David can explain to you how often he's been maintaining what the problems are. Um, I've been maintaining these windows now for the last 12 years. I think we decorate approximately every three years. It's a very expensive process, and I think that since they've stopped making lead-based paint, I can't find a manufacturer that can give me a paint that can stay on the wood more than a year to 18 months. So after we decorate, make all the wood good, approximately 18 months later, you look at it and the paint is peeling. I just think it's the extreme conditions. I mean, it's been a very poor winter. Uh, and again, we've got water penetration. doesn't matter what we seem to do. We can't keep the water out. And I think the only option now, and I've resisted for many years, is to go with a traditional PVC window. 
Okay. Councillor Davey. That, thanks very much. That's a, that's a term I've never heard before, traditional PVC. Um, I mean, following on from that, really, we, we had a, a similar application a little while ago in Clifton Street, which was retrospective because the applicant had um, um, been unaware of the rules in conservation areas and, and had actually put in new PVC, uh, which, which uh, that was a retrospective, and we turned that down. Um, so I, was, I, was, I just kind of wonder why you think that this should be yeah, what, why we would do something different here? You know, why should we allow this when things have been turned down in the past? And, and are these original windows that, you, that you're trying to paint as opposed to, yeah, so how long have those windows been there? Um, I'll let David answer on how long the windows have been there, but with regard to the other points, um, the windows that are proposed have been designed completely with the proper detailing. So as I say, run through horns, not ones that are screwed into the bottom, etc. So they're designed with all the correct proportions of a timber window. Um, as I say, also, yes, planning history is an issue, but a part of that is that an appeal was won in 2001 on this very point. So the planning history can sort of be interpreted either way. But I'll ask David about the length of time. Okay, I think it was eight years ago that we replaced three or four of the sashes, repaired the box, box parts next to them. Uh, I had two or three carpenters, chippies, cabinet makers, whatever you call them. We had various, all had various ways of doing their job. And all I wanted them to say to me, yes, this would last. You know, two coats of prime and make sure the joints are sealed, everything's correct. And those are the worst windows now. They've, a lot of them have just rotted out, the boxes have gone. Um, there's just no way I can put wood back in there. And I think the modern woods aren't treated as the old fashioned woods were. They weren't laid out to dry. They don't make things as they used to, as, as we say. So I, I don't really know what the answer is other than going to PVC. Any further questions? I have one for you. Sorry, Councillor Theobald, go on. The, these windows, are they secondary double glazed? Or, you know, sort of ones that have got the glass behind because that would keep the water out, wouldn't it, and keep it warmer, wouldn't it? Yes, they are all uh, double glazed units within the frame. They're not secondary double glazed. They are already a double glazed unit in there. So that would look exactly the same. Okay, I've got a question for you. Um, have you sought advice from conservation officers here on materials, paints, and so on? Because I, I'm, I'm aware of the question that you're raising, but I would raise back to you that within my own ward, obviously, there's the painting of Brunswick Square and Terrace, and there's a very, very vibrant question there in terms of they find materials that are appropriate to the job. On the whole, it works well, but have you considered advice, is my question. I've taken advice. I've been to all the paint manufacturers, but nobody can give me a paint that's, I, I don't know if it's because it's on that corner property there and it gets a lot of wind. If you're just round the corner, I don't think properties suffer so much. You know, we've got another property, an oriental place, which is just off the seafront, not a problem. I think it's because it's right on that corner position. Uh, the wind, the wind is so strong, sometimes you can't open the door in the um, winter. And also, when it blows, it just blows through through the sashes. I just think because it's, it's forward facing. And as I look along that parade there, nearly everybody has got PVC windows. The Ship Hotel have got them, Next Door's got them, the Grand Hotel. They're all PVC windows. Above Not first floor level. Reason for us to grant you PVC. <laughs> All right. Okay. I just I just thought that that's the way everybody had gone because of the ongoing problem. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No. Thank you both very much indeed for coming in today. Can I just yeah. If I could just clarify a point raised by the speakers to members, and that is in respect of. Um, the weathering and the problems of that particular site um, with timber. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to remind members of the seafront location, the Brunswick um, conservation area, the terraces, the Adelaide Crescent properties, 
um, Sussex Square, all of which are Grade 1 listed or Grade 2 star listed buildings, and obviously they all have timber sliding sashes, and people are keeping their timber sliding sashes, and I just wanted to remind members of, of that particular point. Questions? Councillor Cox? Yes, the, can, can you address the point raised by the applicant in respect of the um, appeal that was won? And, um, you know, I, I'm obviously fearful that if we refuse this today, that that, that will be used as a precedent and there will be an appeal and it, they will win and we'll end up costing the council taxpayer. So I don't, I don't want to do a futile refusal. As I said in my presentation, the appeal was um, allowed in 2001. We have a completely different policy background to what we had in 2001. The MPPF has been published, which is different national planning guidance um, and also the Brighton Hove local plan. In particular, we've introduced SPD 09, which is referring to architectural features, which talks about replacement UPVC windows um, on buildings such as this. And it says on those fronting a street scene, it is contrary to that. So that has been published since. It wasn't in existence in 2001, it is now, and therefore we as officers are placing a significant amount of weight on that new guidance that we have, and that's why we're recommending the, uh, the refusal. Okay. Further questions? No. Who would like to start debate? No. Councillor Davey. Thank you. Well, we, we, I think we did... Uh, agonize over this a little, a little with, with the Clifton Street uh, proposal and, and that included the site visit um, and I think members put a lot of consideration in, 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 into the, the, the dilemma of the, the landlord there uh, but I think we, we came to the conclusion that our policy is very clear that UPVC windows are not De likely to be deemed acceptable in conservation areas and, and I don't see that this is any different really. I, I, I do sympathise um, but I know there are a lot of materials out there. I mean personally we had some uh, very expensive uh, replacement sash windows put in recently and, and, and I know there's various woods out there uh, which you know, are much more durable than, than, than pine uh, that, that I guess many of these were made from. So I, I think there are options out there and clearly you know, there are many seafront locations across the whole city, across, across, the, across the city, which yeah, are faced with this dilemma. And, and, and yeah, presumably many of them are having to invest in replacement wooden windows. And yeah, I don't see any reason why we, we, we should um, you know, digress from that here. So I will, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Are any further points? Councillor Theobald. It's just a shame that the um, UPVC um, frames do appear bulkier um, and don't look as nice as the wooden sash windows. It's just a shame there's nothing that really looks exactly the same because they don't. Um, and we have got this policy and I'm afraid it isn't a very prominent part of the seafront. So I think, we, you know, really we should stick to the policy. Any further points? Well, at my top worth, it's not only that this is a seafront location, it's a really, really prominent building. It's a much-loved building um, that a lot of people have a lot. At 39, especially, the corner one on Ship, on Ship Street. And my experience in my own ward is that actually where you sit down with the conservation team and you get the appropriate advice, actually, there's weather durable materials, both paint and for windows and so on and so forth, and that has worked. There's more square feet of my ward that's a conservation area than not, so that affects a lot of buildings. Um, so I think that there needs to be a conversation that happens here between um, the applicant and the conservation team here about the sort of materials that they can use and the sort of windows um, that they should be uh, going for in this particular site. Are there any further points? No, shall we move to the... Yes, Jeanette, and then we'll Just to the confirm, councillors, we've checked the, um, the, the forms. There's been no pre-app advice sought from our conservation team. And the advice is free, and it is intended to remain free at the point of contact. Good. Um, no further points in debate. Now let's move to the vote. This is BH 2014-00294 for Householder Planning Consent at 39 to 40 Kings Road, Brighton. The recommendation is to refuse. Can I see all those who would like to refuse the application? Ten. That's 10 to refuse. And all those who would prefer to grant and abstentions? 
Thank you. My appeal to the applicant and uh, to Mr. Barron would be to um, get the free advice from the conservation team on this and um, hopefully come back in with another application. Um, I'm sorry that this is going to affect um, so many of the tenants there. Um, I hope that a suitable way forward can be found. Thank you. Um, it's 10 past four. I'm proposing to take a 10 minute recess. Thank you all very much. Hello, back again. Thank you all very much. Um, councillors, would you like a presentation on the next application? Amber Court in Salisbury Road. It's in my ward, so I wouldn't mind a presentation if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, this is BH 2012 one two zero one two six three for full planning at Amber Court, 38 Salisbury Road, Hove. The recommendation is to grant. I'll pass it over to Nicola for the presentation. Thank okay. you. The application site comprises a three-storey flat roof building which contains 14 flats and is located on Salisbury Road. Uh, this is the application site here outlined in red. This is Salisbury Road. Um, this is the block plan. This is the application site um, fronting onto Salisbury Road. Um, this again is a view of Amber Court. This is the rear elevation um, and the rear area uh, for parking. This is the existing floor plan. Um, the ground floor of the building is raised above street level with a stepped entrance leading to a single storey lobby to the front of the building. And the rear of the building incorporates a low ground floor level accessed by a side driveway um, comprising of seven garages. The eastern side of Salisbury Road is predominantly relatively modern flatted development between three and four storeys in height. In contrast, the western side of Salisbury Road is characterised by historic semi-detached buildings within the Willett Estate Conservation Area. So this is the existing front elevation, existing side and existing rear. So plan permission is sought for the formation of a lower ground floor level to the existing building to create new office accommodation within um, use class B1 of approximately 113 square metres. The proposal will entail excavation works to the frontage of the site adjoining Salisbury Road to create a new ramped access arrangement and cycle parking facilities. The proposed lower ground floor level would comprise fenestration comparable to the upper levels of the building. So this is the proposed floor plan. And the commercial, the garages would remain the same. So this is the commercial unit. This would be the front elevation. This would be the front elevation in context. And this is the street scene. So you can see the new windows just there above the boundary wall. Letters of objection have been received and are outlined on page 56 of the report. And the main considerations in the determination of the application relate to the impact of the proposed lower ground floor office accommodation on the character and appearance of the area, neighbouring amenity and highway safety. The proposed development would create a lower ground floor office unit of approximately 113 square metres. And policy EM4 of the local plan applies. There is no supporting documentation accompanying the application to demonstrate a need for office accommodation on the application site, and it would appear that the proposal is speculative. As such, the proposal does not co does conflict rather the aims of policy EM4. The application site is though centrally located, and the additional office accommodation would potentially provide additional employment opportunities within the city, which would be supported by the MPPF. The existing frontage of the building is marked by a raised terrace area and stepped entrance leading to the internal ground floor level of the building. The proposal would create a lower ground floor level within the ma main envelope of the existing building, though lowering at ground floor level to the northern section of the site. A ramped pedestrian access would be formed within the front curtilage in place of the existing raised terrace and an off-street off parking space with a new boundary wall constructed along the frontage of the site. 
The number of buildings on Salisbury Road incorporate lower ground floor levels, and the formation of a lower ground floor level and associated new access would not therefore appear in Congress in this setting. The development will replicate the proportions, alignment and rhythm of windows and upper floors of the building with external brickwork to match. The proposed lower ground floor is considered to be well designed, cited and detailed in relation to the existing building and wider street scene. Turning to amenity, the nature of the proposed works, which primarily involve excavation at lower ground floor level, would not lead to harmful loss of light or outlook for occupants of adjoining properties. The key concern is therefore the impact of the proposed use. The proposed development wanted to introduce an office use to a site solely in residential, and the environmental health team have raised concerns that use of the low ground floor office accommodation could potentially lead to noise and disturbance for occupants at ground floor level. However, the use class order states that uses within a class B1 are capable of being carried out in any residential area by reason of noise, vibration, smell, fume, smoke, soot, ash, dust or grit. And in principle, the formation of a B1 premises would not therefore be expected to cause material harm to neighbouring amenity. It is therefore considered that refusal on the application on this basis of increased noise would not be warranted. It is considered that conditions restricting hours of use within the office premises and requiring details of soundproofing would satisfactorily protect amenity and the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Councillor Hyde. Yeah, a couple of questions, actually. Um, the uh, loss of parking space, um, was, was there any? Some of the garages are going, are they? No, I thought there were some of being retained, but I didn't get the beginning of that. Um, and also, uh, 14 cycle place. This seems a lot for this small um, proposal. seems excessive. And I would like to see what is at the front of the building now and um, the ramp that is going to be... Mm. Propose. Um, it's very difficult to make a judgment on this. Have you got any images of, of the new lower ground floor? It's all a bit sketchy for me. That's from my questions. Shall we bring in Steve on the transport questions, if that's okay? Yeah, I can go to the transport questions. Um, there is a loss of two um, parking spaces to the front of the property. However, the garages, um, all the other garages are retained. We wouldn't have any objections to the loss of two parking spaces in this central location. Um, in regard to the 14 cycle parking spaces, um, we do have minimum standards. Um, however, I think that the applicant came forward with this number, so anything above that number we'd find acceptable. So it's probably driven from the applicant's side rather than us requiring 14 spaces. Um, and anything above our standards, we, we, we welcome in terms of cycle parking. Okay, in terms of the other questions about the facade, I have to say that was my concern, page 59, 8.6 frontage treatments was um, a question I had. <coughs> so this is where the ramp would go down. There's it in floor plan. Do you mean materials? Yeah. Plans show railings, so um, if you bear with me. There, no, these are railings. Yeah, perhaps I can just add, perhaps they are glazed because you can see through the railings, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're just railings, there's nothing. Oh, I see. And the appearance of the new addition? 
the, the new the new lower ground floor it's just is, is that is that pop that is it okay yeah thank you So you would see the excavation here with windows to match existing. Thank you. Okay. Is there any further questions? Councillor Theobald. Um, is there no room around the back for cycle parking rather than doing all this? So, you know, um, and is this cycle parking for the office work people? And how many are proposed to be in there? Steve? Can you help us? I think it, it could be potentially communal um, because it is open access. So potentially the residents could use that or visitors to the residential developments above or the, or the office. Um, I think it's primarily generated because of this planning application, obviously, in the office development, but it's for communal for users as a development as a whole. Fair um, I think from a highway perspective, it's ideal to have cycle parking located at the front of buildings because obviously people want the quickest access to the building where they're going to so it's preferential to have it located to the front in terms of highway transport and um, reasons yeah well presumably you want sort of passive surveillance of cycle parking as well it's safer is there a further question in terms of council theobald's point about how many people are expected yeah. we would presumably have a ready reckoner on that or whatever i was just going to point out that these photos what you can see on the screen is is the rear area and obviously we've got parking and entrance to garages so there really isn't the space there for cycle parking given turning areas and, and the parking situation in terms of the numbers the accommodation provides 113 square meters of floor space unfortunately the answer in terms of number of employees um, hasn't been answered on the form it's a zero so um, I don't know <laughs> The economic regeneration team usually come up with a figure which was, is around one person per, I think it's five square meters or something. So um, it wouldn't have been crucial to determining the application to have that amount. The applicant hasn't indicated how many employees they think would be in the space. Okay. No, it's really significant. No, are there any further questions? No. Um, I'm wondering about materials because there doesn't seem to be so much detail. I'm just wondering about bringing that back to chairs because I'm actually a wee bit concerned about the sort of lack of detail here and I am also concerned that it's opposite um, the Willard Estate Conservation Area. So admittedly, the, the, the buildings that are there are not the, uh, the apex of beauty. Um, but that doesn't matter. I think we should still be fussy about what we impose on our buildings. Councillor Lettman. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Yes, to, I mean, to, to, to echo that, if you look on pages 62 and 63 at the pre-commencement conditions, the materials, the soundproofing and the sustainability are all um, down there to be, all, you know, they have to be, uh, they have to be okayed before this can go ahead. I'm just, I feel a little as if we're kind of coming in at this at rather an early stage, as if actually there, it would have been, I would have preferred there to have been more detail. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, possibly um, going through chairs might be the way ahead. Okay. The three conditions. Very unusual. Very unusual. Um, you've started to turn the mic off. Okay, so there seems to be some implication from what Councillor Lippmann has just said that it's the three pre-commencement conditions and I'm just wondering if that's echoed by the rest of the committee because what I could understand so far was that both myself and Councillor Hyde seem to be talking about materials and samples and that's why I was talking about bringing that back to chairs whereas I wasn't so concerned, if I'm honest, about soundproofing or sustainability measures and I wasn't sure that that was being echoed in other places.
Yeah, I'm just Thank concerned you, that um, 8.19 on page 861 does point out um, there is extremely limited information submitted as part of the application as far as sustainability is concerned. Um, okay. The advice I was giving to the Chair was councillors have signified that on some of the larger schemes in particular they would like to have the ability to agree discharge conditions on materials in particular. In terms of sustainability and soundproofing, as a committee, as a planning committee, you haven't identified that you've got any particular concerns with any of the sustainability measures or the soundproofing that we've agreed in terms of past um, discharge condition applications. So notwithstanding the fact the information is limited, they're pre-commencement conditions and they're normally delegated matters. So um, that was all I was putting to you really. It's up to you. Do you want to try and proceed this? Are you sure? Okay. I think, notwithstanding all of that, I wouldn't mind actually the materials coming back to chairs. So, if, if that's okay. Um, are there any further questions on this or any further debate? No? Shall we move to the vote? Can we put an informative on? So we'll come back like to years. chairs. Because it could be like three or four years from now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that'll be an informative back to chairs. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, informative now. You're looking to all conditions subject to materials condition being approved. At chairs. But I'd like that put on as an informative on the decision notice. Otherwise, oh, right. yes, when it comes yeah. in in yeah. three years' time, we'll just forget. Yeah. We, we don't have a mechanism. Yeah. Councillors, we're just talking uh, through the how we would pick these, how we pick these items up, and my suggestion is that you put an informative on that just advises the applicant that the materials will be agreed in consultation with chairs, and chairs, the people who hold those posts, they change over time, and this application uh, may not come back to us for like two or three years, and so. We just need a mechanism to identify that on the decision notice so the applicant knows what's happening, that's all. Yeah? Right. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, just, just to clarify, the recommendation will have to change slightly to, to recite the fact that permission is granted, but the condition, the material condition, will be um, delegated to Jeanette to agree in consultation with the vice the chair and vice chair, et cetera, et cetera. But so far as the decision notice is concerned, as Jeanette has said, just to flag up to the, to the applicant that the discharge of that particular condition will not be Jeanette's, well, it will be her decision, um, but in consultation with the chair, vice chair, and et cetera, is that okay? So it's, that's really for the, the, the applicant's benefit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, great. Thank you all. Um, we'll move to the vote. Um, this is BH 2012-01263 for full planning at Amber Court 38 Salisbury Road Hove. The recommendation is to grant, can I see all those councillors who would like to grant the application? That's unanimous. Thank you all very much. The final application in front of us today is um, the Priory and London Road. First of all, do councillors want a presentation? No. Okay. Um, we'll move straight to the vote. Um, this is BH 2013-03946 for full planning at Box C and D, the Priory, London Road, Brighton. The recommendation is minded to grant. Can I see all those councillors who are minded to grant? That's unanimous again. Thank you all very much. The remaining items are for noting only. Thank you all very much. The meeting is now closed. Thank you. I thought Councillor Theobald would want a presentation on that. Yeah, yeah. She's missed it. She's missed it.
same no, time. No, made a statement. I was quite looking. I was looking at this because it says relevant history. Is it one of those? Sorry. On the top of 110, it, page 110, it's got down block C and D, relevant history, and it's got approved 11th of 4th, 2013. So why, this is for um, extension of time. Why would that be there? And then we're applying that up there when the same block C and D didn't make sense. Oh, it's just for eight flats, and that's four. Is that what it is? Yeah, well, I'll be very much against that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Are I don't think it's fair on the other the applicants. Okay. And they've all, when you think of how many people have actually objected on this, all of the people are probably don't want it. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, but I just want might be recorded that I'm objecting to it. Can we have a re vote in order that Councillor. We need to get Councillor oh, Wells back in the room. Yeah, will you? Councillor Wells has gone. Right, Councillor Wells, Wells has gone. The vote wouldn't make any difference. Wouldn't make any difference, I'm afraid, for that. What about, what, what about recording in the minutes after the vote is taken to say that Councillor Theobald made it very clear that had she, she participated in the vote, um, that she would have... Sorry, okay. I was looking at this, that's why I thought it was recorded. Councillor Wells has gone. No, you can't. Yes. The meeting's over. <laughs> Thank you all very much. The meeting is over.